Good, well, um, if you have a Bible you want to follow along, uh, turn back to the book of Acts. That would be helpful to have that in front of you. I'll put some verses up as we go along as well. Um, I, think I, I think I've said before uh, at Bethel in your hearing, most of you anyway you're here, by way of confession that I've only read um, a little bit of the famous book, The Lord of the Rings. Um, there are some literary people in my family who would be horrified to hear that I haven't read the whole thing. Uh, I had good intentions, I really did. We, we bought the book and uh, I was going to read it, but it just they, they didn't materialise, unfortunately. And the only bit I read um, was uh, the first part of the second uh, part of the book, if you like, the second section. And the only reason I read that small part of the second section was because I'd watched the first of the films, I know it's shock horror, what's the film first, and I wanted to know what happened next because I'm, I'm just nosy and curious. And uh, I read about three chapters and I satisfied my curiosity and I didn't pick the book up again after that. So um, I still haven't read it. I've watched the films, but I haven't read it. My curiosity was enough to sort of push me on to see a bit more of the story. And uh, perhaps you know that feeling. Um, you've heard the first part of the story and uh, it grabs you and you want to know what comes next. Um, TV series used to be like that, didn't they? You used to have to wait a whole week until the next episode to find out what happened. No longer, you can just binge the whole thing now on a box set if you want online. But um, that was how it used to be. Well, um, we began looking at the Book of Acts, and I don't suppose it's been on your mind to find out what happens next, because you could just read it. But I want you to sort of get something of that, really. That we, we, we got to a point uh, of kind of resolution of a few things, and we paused, and uh, well, what happened next? What, what's the next part of the story? It's very interesting to read and interesting to know. So uh, for, a, for, a, for a, the next uh, few weeks and months, we're going, to, we're going to read on in the Book of Acts and we're going to study it together. Um, it's quite possible that, uh, and, and probably likely that you have forgotten most of what we looked at before, and I'm not sure I could tell you all my messages uh, from early on in 2019. So I want to give you just a quick, very quick recap, uh, just so we can get our bearings really as to where we are in this book. And then we'll continue with this short passage at the end of chapter 9. This morning, it is only a short passage, but it will, uh, it will be a helpful bridge into what's going to come next. Um, when, um, I don't know about you, but when we read events in the Bible, they can seem uh, quite distant, can't they, from our own world. Quite a different world, a different culture, a different setting, different history leading up to them, and um, different language they're speaking, and, it, and um, they can seem very distant to us. Um, they can seem like stories that give us uh, a window onto that world, but, but they're just a, a mile away from where we are in our place and our setting. And we can then make the mistake, if we jump from that, to thinking that they are interesting in a sort of history lesson kind of way, but not that relevant for us today. Um, and so if that's the case, well, wh why, why study what happened then? Well, today I want to take my cue really from from the whole point of the book of Acts as Luke the writer introduces it to us. So Acts, you remember, is, uh, is really a two-part, um, Acts is the second part of a two-volume work written by Luke to his friend Theophilus. And so here's how he starts uh, in Luke 1. Um, he, he opens his gospel with these words. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us just as they were handed down to us by those who were from the first eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Therefore, I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning. It seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you've been taught. So Luke's a doctor, carefully investigated, as you would expect, from eyewitnesses and servants of the word, put on an orderly account with a distinct purpose, um, that you might know the certainty of the things you have been taught. So Luke is not just writing bare history, he's writing history with an agenda that he wants uh, his, uh, the, the people he's writing to, Theophilus and others, to know the certainty, the truth of the things that they've been taught. Um, so when Luke comes to the second part of his uh, book, this is how he begins. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. I wrote about all that Jesus began to do, and by implication he's saying, now I'm going to write about all that Jesus continues to do and to teach. Acts is the continuing work of the Lord Jesus. Not now through Jesus in person, being there in front of his people, but by his Spirit and through his apostles. And so the point is, although Jesus ascended to heaven, that's the great kind of 
uh, turning point moment between Luke and the Luke, the Gospel, and Acts. So that's the, the sort of hinge, if you like, between those two. Uh, he is the same Jesus who is still working out his purposes and still saving people and still blessing his church. And so in this sort, sort, uh, section that we're going to look at this morning, there's a kind of, it's a kind of bridge leading us back to what God was doing uh, with Paul to Peter the Apostle. And we'll see that the Lord Jesus Christ is still ministering his grace. He still has the same authority over sin and all its effects. And he is the Lord Jesus who is still building and increasing his kingdom. So while these things might take place in a world that's very different to ours and a million miles away, we say it's the same Lord Jesus who is doing these things then, as he was in Acts, and as he is now. So this is hugely relevant for us. What God is doing then, he is still doing uh, in, in our day to day. And so I hope that that will encourage you this morning, despite all that's uh, going on in the world, despite all of the, the things that are happening and some that will happen that we're not sure about. Um, if you want a, a, a better recap of the book of Acts than that, that was just a very a quick one. But if you want a good recap, I'd recommend the Bible Project video. I often use those. And um, here's, the, here's the poster. I don't expect you to be able to read or see any of that, really. It's quite small on the screen. But um, you will notice one thing, at least, hopefully, if you can see it here. After the introduction, chapters 2 to 7 are what God is doing in Jerusalem. And he told his disciples that uh, he wanted them to stay in Jerusalem, but then to go out. And so the next section is the next area that Jesus told his disciples to go to. So from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria. And then the last part of the book is really the uh, beginning of that ministry to the rest of the world, which is also what Jesus had told his disciples to do. So you've got those three sections. And if you want to watch the video and, and look at that yourself, you can do well, let's look at these uh, words from the end of chapter 9 then. This, this short section, uh, just with the account of these uh, two uh, miraculous healings that uh, Peter is the instrument and the, and the agent of, um, and uh, we'll see what God is saying to us. Here's the first thing I want to, to say to you this morning. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ is still ministering his grace. So I want to pick up on that theme that this is, this is Luke's account of what Jesus is continuing to do. The first point is this, the Lord Jesus is still ministering his grace. Uh, Luke had spent some time with, um, with Saul in his book, so chapters, uh, chapters 8 and 9, um, showing how Saul had been converted, showing how this guy who'd once been an enemy and an, an opposer of the church had been transformed by meeting Christ and immediately ha has begun to preach and defend the faith that he once opposed. And it's, it's an am amazing U-turn. Uh, and last Thursday we saw some of the ups and downs of that in the notes that I sent out. Um, and we ended up with the high point, really, of the end of that section, verse 31 of chapter 9. Um, this summary statement that Luke puts a few times in his, in his book here. Uh, sort of a, a sort of breather, if you like. You saw sort of something dramatic happens and then you sort of take a breath and you say, Whoa. and this is what he says. The church throughout Judea, Galilee and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened, living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. It increased in numbers. So there's a kind of high point of drama, a source conversion, and then there's a kind of time of, of peace and settlement. There was peace. The church was grown. And so it seems that Peter, along with the other apostles, he'd stayed in Jerusalem to start with when the persecution after Stephen's martyrdom had broken out. P uh, Peter, with the other apostles, had stayed in Jerusalem. But um, while well, everyone else is scattered, but those scattered Christians... Um, spoke about Jesus wherever they went and, uh, and wherever they traveled. So there were churches that, that, were, that came into existence as Christians, uh, as people became Christians. And so Peter had traveled a little uh, in response to the spread of the gospel. If you read Acts chapter 8, you'll see when Philip uh, has, a, has a ministry in Samaria and people are converted, they send for, for Peter to come, uh, among others. And so he's already had a little bit of that kind of traveling itinerant ministry. Um, and this little section uh, records two incidents as part of those further travels. Peter is still travelling around. Uh, this place, uh, Lydda, uh, was mostly a, a Gentile city. It wasn't a Jewish settlement, a Gentile city. <coughs> and it was about 25 miles from Jerusalem. And uh, the other place that is mentioned here, Joppa, you may know is the uh, port that is now Jaffa. And Joppa is... Um, is a little bit further, about 10 miles beyond Lydda from Jerusalem. So they're pretty close together, not that far away from Jerusalem. Uh, Joppa is the place that uh, Jonah uh, picked up his ship to run away from God in the book of Jonah, you, you may know. 
And so as Peter travels around, he, uh, Luke for us selects these two miracles that took place there through Peter. So there's this guy, Aeneas, he's, been, uh, he's paralyzed, and as a result, he's been bedridden for eight years, so pretty helpless, really. And this lady, Tabitha, or Dorcas, they're just two translations of the same name, which means uh, gazelle, I think. Um, she uh, had, had been a, a godly woman, she'd served others, and uh, she'd become sick and died. And Peter is the instrument of God's power in both cases. It's not Peter's power, it's obviously God's power to bring healing and blessing. Now, if those miracles there sound a little bit familiar, well, they should do. I think that's deliberate. They are repeats, really, of miracles that Jesus himself had performed during his ministry, during his earthly ministry. Uh, Jesus healed many people. So look at a verse like this from Matthew 4. This is a kind of summary statement in Matthew. Early on in Jesus' ministry, news about him spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering with severe pain, the demon possessed, those having seizures, the paralyzed, and he treat and, and he healed them. So Jesus healed lots of people with all different kinds of conditions. But uh, you'll notice that he's mentioned specifically the paralyzed, those who were unable to move, and Jesus healed them. And the most famous story, I guess, of a paralyzed man is uh, that recorded in three of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. The guy who's, uh, who's carried to Jesus on his mat, unable to help himself, and they can't get in the house, so they you know, pull a hole in the roof and then lower him down right in front of Jesus. Um, there's some parallels with that story here, um, because in very similar words to what Jesus uses for that guy, Peter heals this paralyzed man. He tells him to get up and tidy his mat. Now, that would be a very cruel thing to say to someone, wouldn't it, uh, who was paralysed, unless, unless he first could say what Peter says in verse 34. He doesn't just say, get up and tidy your mat. He says, Jesus Christ heals you. Without that, it's cruel, isn't it? But with that, it's a great blessing to this man. And he does. Jesus Christ does heal him. And that makes it clear, doesn't it? it Peter wasn't claiming any special power for himself here. But it was, it was Jesus Christ who healed and who restored and ministered to this poor guy. And the Lord Jesus continues his ministry he, uh, to minister his grace. And he announces it through the Apostle Peter here. And the miracle in Joppa was even more astonishing. That was pretty astonishing, to be healed of paralysis. This lady, Tabitha, had become sick. She, had, she hadn't yet been buried when the disciples there heard that Peter was close by. And it is interesting, isn't it? They must have been expecting a miracle. You know, who do you call when someone has died? You call the undertaker. You don't call for a, a doctor. It's too late. And so they must have been expecting a miracle, I think, because they, they send for Peter, even though she's died. And that ought to remind us of several times when Jesus called back to life someone who had already died. The son of the, uh, the widow of Nain, recorded in Luke 7, is one example. Lazarus, of course, in John 11. But especially the, the daughter of Jairus, recorded in Matthew 9. That incident has a lot of similar, similarities with this one. The person was clearly dead, there's no question. They weren't asleep. Um, they must have been expecting a miracle. Why did they call Peter to come? Um, in that case of Jairus, the, the mourners filled the room. But... When the miracle happens, they sent out. And um, it was interesting, a few commentators made the point that if Peter was speaking the same language as Jesus, if he was using Aramaic when he, when he said these words, what he says to this lady Tabitha is almost exactly the same as what Jesus says to that little girl. You remember the, um, the passage, I think, on the screen, yeah, Mark 4. Um, Jesus sends him out of the room. He took her by the hand and said, Talitha ku, which means little girl, I say, get up, which is one letter different from Peter saying to this woman, Tabitha, ku, uh, Tabitha, get up. Now, Peter is not healing in his own name or power here. It's in the name of Jesus. And because he, he prays, he prays and asks the Lord to bring her back to life. Luke is showing us that the Lord Jesus is still ministering his grace. Even though he's not present bodily with his church as he was, he's ministering his grace by the power of his Holy Spirit and through his servants, the apostles and disciples. Now, this was not just true for Peter, but it is true for all God's people, and that includes us. We are not any the poorer 
although we might think it sometimes, we're not any the worse off for not having been in Jerusalem and witnessed all that took place. We're not second-class Christians because we, we weren't there 2,000 odd years ago. Acts is showing us that Christ is still at work and that he's not left his people, that he's keeping his promise to be with them to the end of the age, to be with us always. And the fact that we are a Christian church in Lawiston this morning is a witness to the fact that God has kept his promise, hasn't he? That he's, the gospel has spread from Jerusalem and into Judea and Samaria and into the ends of the earth. We're the ends of the earth, really, as far as they were concerned. God has kept his promise. And there is a church here. And God continues to minister his grace to us, to, to call people, to save people, to uh, keep his people, to guide us, and to bless us with his word and his presence. All of this is grace. We don't deserve a single thing except God's judgment because of our sin and our rebellion. But through Christ we receive grace and the favour of God. God's ministering of his grace, it might not be precisely the same as it was here. There's no guarantee here of miraculous healing or of restoration of life when someone has died. But it may be that there are it may be that there are testimonies of such things. Maybe you've heard testimonies and I have too. But other times it may be God's grace to press on through difficulty to bear with suffering. I think at the moment of, uh, of Robbie Hall, the pastor of Hope, who's who's got serious cancer and it may yet take his life, but he's had a ministry through it and a testimony through it, uh, that God has kept despite his suffering. And God's grace to you might not be to take you out of suffering but to keep you through it and to bless you in the middle of it. The important thing is to look to Christ and to lean on him. Peter was just an instrument. He wasn't the source of that grace. Only Christ is. So for us, we must stay close to him. We must look to him, lean upon him. He's still ministering his grace if we, if we come to him. And if you're in need and who of us isn't, then run to him and ask him. He won't ignore you. That's the first thing. The Lord Jesus is still ministering grace. Secondly, the Lord Jesus still has all authority over sin. I want you just to look at these two uh, these two miracles for a moment. Look at the detail here a little. Uh, they were miracles that Jesus had performed, as we just said, uh, and on more than one occasion. And they are both really hopeless cases, aren't they? There's, there's nothing else that people could do who were involved. Even with all our... Uh, medical advances, all the benefit of our science. Often we're no better off than these than they were then, are we? Um, you've probably read and heard the story of Jody Erickson Tarder, I'm sure, who was paralysed as a teen. Um, and she has a famous testimony, a well-known testimony of the way God uh, dealt with her. She's a lovely, godly Christian with a ministry, and she remains paralysed. She's not been healed. She's, she's not a testimony of God's healing, she's a testimony of God's grace in that, in that paralysis that she suffers. As for death itself, there are, there are many, many people trying to hold it off, aren't they? Trying to cheat it. We're all doing that in a sense, aren't we? Trying to prolong life. But 100% of people still die. And those who, you know, those who f freeze their bodies, uh, or their heads, some of them really, I think are clutching up very, very useless straws, really, to think that one day they may be brought back to life. We can't run from it. It's our greatest enemy, the last enemy. But before the name and the authority of the Lord Jesus, paralysis, and we could say illness of every kind, and even death itself, must bow before him, before his authority. Because Christ has the authority of all he's made over this world, even even affected, even broken by sin as it is. Now, I don't mean that the, the paralysis of, of Aeneas or the death of Tabitha were as a result of, of, of a particular specific sin that they did. I'm not saying that was the case. There's nothing in the text to lead us to that. And in fact, Jesus elsewhere in the Gospels warns us from doing that. Uh, John chapter 9 is the guy who was born blind. Jesus said it wasn't because of sin. It was so God could have the glory. But we can say sin... Entering the world at the very start brought death and illness and the corruption of this creation. And so the whole creation is affected and it continues to be affected. But Jesus has all authority over sin and he shows it by his miracles and he shows it by continuing those miracles through his apostles. And he still has that same authority today. With just a word, he is able to banish sin and heal. Now it is 
a mystery, isn't it, of God's providence, why he doesn't heal all who are sick, why he doesn't heal all those even that we pray for and ask. Why he takes some people early on in their lives and others he leaves to live out long lives to their old age. But because he is the one with authority, we, we trust him with those decisions. But these examples are to encourage us and to assure us that sin will not have the last word. That even death itself is, is transformed for those who trust in Christ and believe in him. So this little resurrection of Tabitha, as we might call it, was just a temporary man. She was not resurrected to a glorious new life that we're looking forward to. Lazarus, we are sure, died again, even though he was raised. But Christ was raised from the dead, not to die again, not by the word of someone else, but by his own power, and he lives forever. And that's what we're looking forward to as his people. The book of Hebrews compares Jesus as a priest to, uh, to all his other priests. And this is what it says, Hebrews 7, 23. Now there have been many priests since death prevented them from continuing in office. So every priest that ever was in the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, died. But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. He's not limited. He's not, his priesthood doesn't end and get passed on. And therefore, this is, this is the, the conclusion we're to come to. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him. Because he always lives to intercede for them. He's, he's our, our, our perpetual, our eternal mediator. And so our salvation is secure. He's able to save completely and to intercede for us. And he has all authority still over sin and all its effects. So do you want to know peace with God and your sins forgiven? Do you want to be free from the fear of death, the fear of a guilty conscience before God? Well, then you must come to Christ and you must ask him to save you. And he will. Christ was raised from the dead after paying for all the sin of his people to give us life in him. He has that authority, he shows it, and he still has it. Finally, briefly, Luke is showing us in this passage that the Lord Jesus is still increasing his kingdom, he's still growing his kingdom, he's still building his church. Um, it, you just need to zoom out a little bit and think of the wider context of what's happening here. We'll come back to this next time, I think. Um, I said earlier, this little section is a kind of bridge. Uh, Luke spent a bit of time talking about uh, Saul and his conversion and what was going on there. And Saul was part of Stephen's martyrdom, you know, and that story. So that's been uh, Luke's uh, focus for a little while. But now uh, he's going to come back in chapter 10 to Peter, to the Apostle Peter, and what's going on with him. And so this, this section is bringing Peter back into the story, if you like. Um, why is that important? Well, what has Peter been doing? What's he, what's he doing here? Peter was based mostly in Jerusalem, as we said, and uh, the church was very focused on Jerusalem. But as people scattered through the persecution following Stephen's martyrdom, the gospel began to spread, and the church grew outside of Jerusalem. This guy Philip has a great ministry in Samaria, and Peter is now travelling around a bit, a bit more widely. He's seeing God at work outside of Jerusalem, outside of the Jewish people. And God here is preparing him and um, preparing the way for him to understand that the church is growing and increasing and and what would be a very difficult thing for him as a Jew to understand, God is bringing Gentiles into the church on the same footing as the Jews who were there in the church. And so I think even the very last verse of, of chapter 9 has something of that in it. Uh, look at verse uh, 43. It's just a little comment, a little throwaway comment. You may think, well, who cares where Peter stayed? Peter stayed in Joppa, it says, for some time with a tanner named Simon. I think that is an interesting point uh, because Peter is, is a Jew and, and if you read on the story you'll see his Jewishness is, is an important thing and a big thing for him. But here he's staying with this guy who's a tanner. Now you know what a tanner does? A tanner takes skins of dead animals and prepares them so they can be used uh, for clothing, leather and all sorts of other things. Now we, we know, don't we, from reading Leviticus, that the problem that the Jews would have with things that link them to death, that relate to death. He wouldn't have wanted to go anywhere near. It would have made him ceremonially unclean. And here is Peter staying in the house of this guy whose everyday job is handling carcasses of animals and some of them not even kosher animals as well. So I think there's something there about Peter already starting to overcome some of the, 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 the prejudices that he carried over from being a devout Jew. But more than that, what God is doing with Peter, I think, here is preparing him 
or what he's going to have with this guy Cornelius in the next couple of chapters, a kind of light bulb moment really, where he realises that God is going to save the Gentiles and bring them into the church and they're going to stand shoulder to shoulder with people who have been Jews. And then they don't have to become Jews first. They can be welcomed into this new multi-ethnic community called the church and they'll be every much as part of the people of God as the Jews are. Now, as we'll see, this was a, this was a massive truth for Peter to grasp. It was a real, uh, real mind-blown moment for him. And it takes God to intervene quite strongly to get him to see this. Um, but I think it's beginning here with what is happening to Peter. Um, we all have blind spots, don't we? And you may think, well, I haven't got any blind spots. Well, that's the kind of the point, isn't it? You don't know that you've got them. That's, you're blind to them until, you, until somebody else points them out to you. And I found one interesting comment in one of the books I was reading on these verses. And the, the writer of the book was making the point that um, prejudice... On all, for all sorts of different reasons, is a universal problem in society, in all societies, in all sorts of people. And it can be present in the church too, just prejudice. You know, we sort of, we, we split into tribes or groups or types, and then we, we define ourselves by certain things, and then we look down on others that are not like us. We do that, we do that in denominations and church groups, and we do that in, so, in cultures and societies, um, and it, it can be a big problem. But the book of Acts is showing us there's no room for prejudice. And the guy was making the point that um, uh, Peter, who who really had a big problem with this to start with, uh, is enabled to go and preach to a Roman soldier of all people without prejudice and to welcome him into the church. And he makes the point, he says, well, how does... How does Peter do this? What happens to him? And he said he gives three reasons, and I won't give you the other two, but the first one is this, which I thought was, was quite strange and interesting. He said uh, the first way that God helps him to this is in his experience of foreign <laughs> travels. I'm not sure that you would put that down as a sort of a way of countering prejudice. You'd want to teach them and explain things, but no, he says the fact that Peter is going around and seeing God at work in places where he didn't expect it, um, as, as miracles are performed and people are healed, um, the gospel goes out and people are saved. Just look at, uh, look at these two verses. This is what happens as a result of these two miracles, these two healings. In places outside of Jerusalem, perhaps where Peter is not expected to see and to find faith. Acts 9, 35 and 42. All those who lived in Lydda and Sharon, and it doesn't mean every single person, it means, you know, a load of people there, saw him and turned to the Lord. They saw Aeneas and they said, wow, how did this happen? And I'm sure Anaya said, well, let me tell you my story. People saw him and turned to the Lord. And then, because of what happened to Tabitha, this became known all over Joppa, as you would expect it would do. And many people believed in the Lord. People were saved, they believed in Christ, they became followers of Jesus. So Peter was being shown that God's grace was being ministered still, and to people beyond his Jewish circle, and even in these Gentile cities and towns, and it was partly as Peter was exposed to these other places with a different culture that he saw God's, God's grace to them in the same way that it had been shown to him. So if that's, if that's true, then there's no room for prejudice, is there? If God has shown the same grace to others. Now, I don't know how widely you have travelled. Some of you, I'm sure, have travelled far more widely than I have. But I can say from limited experience, there is nothing like uh, seeing and experiencing another culture to help you see the blind spots in your own it is really very helpful. So I would say to you, travel if you can. There's no church budget for that, I don't think. But um, I would urge it upon you, go, go to other places. You know, when you're away on holiday, don't go to a church that's exactly like this one. Go find a different church, different type. And it might be very helpful to you. You might not enjoy it much at the time, but it might be helpful in just changing your perspective. Just have some of that perspective that, that are helpful. Be, be confident that despite all that's going on in the world at the moment even, the Lord Jesus is increasing his kingdom. He's, he's building his church. Peter was remarkably surprised that God was saving Gentiles. God is building his church. There's nothing his enemies can do. Not even the gates of hell can prevail. Not all the most evil opposition can stop him. And you can be part of that work by speaking about the Lord Jesus to others, by telling others the gospel. The Lord Jesus Christ is still at work. He's still ministering his grace. Thank God that he is. So look to him uh, uh, to bless and ask him to bless. 
and he still has all authority over sin and over everything else. So submit yourself to him and rest with confidence in him. And he's still building and increasing his church. Yes, even, even despite COVID-19, God is still building his church and saving people. So watch out for your own prejudice and blind spots and, and seek his kingdom first. And may God have all the glory as we put his word into practice. Amen. Let's pray. Oh Lord, we thank you that you are a gracious God and we thank you, Lord, that you are still ministering that grace to us and uh, to people like us. We thank you, Lord, that that is our hope for uh, those around us that don't know you yet, Lord, that uh, they too may uh, come into this grace, they may find grace in the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, that you have all authority in heaven and on earth and, Lord, that you, uh, Lord, you have uh, Lord, you are still at work and you are still overcoming the effects of sin in this world. Lord, we know that uh, that will not be complete and, uh, and definitive until this world ends and you bring all things to a conclusion. Lord, but we pray that we might see uh, tokens of your authority and power, Lord, even amongst our own midst, even amongst our own number. That, Lord, we would know uh, power over sin, we would know lives being transformed, and we would see the gospel at work. Lord, here in Lammaston, we pray. And we thank you, Lord, that we have that assurance that you are building your church. You are, Lord, reaching people with the uh, truth of your word. And, Lord, that you're using even feeble, weak instruments as us to do that. So, Lord, we thank you for that. Thank you for, Lord, the promise of your help. We pray that, Lord, we might see this, your church, being built up in the days to come. Lord, we ask this for your glory. And in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.